Thank you all of you for being here this evening. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you a little bit about the upcoming 2012 election. As all of you know, in a few months, the United States will elect a new president or an old president. And the United States will elect new members of Congress, both in the United States Senate and in the United States House. But as we enter the 2012 election, it seems that America has never been more divided. So a few examples. The key signature achievement of the Obama administration in its first term was the Affordable Care Act, which extended health care insurance to a much broader part of the United States population. And it turns out that the Affordable Care Act passed both houses of Congress, both the Senate and the House of Representatives, with absolutely no votes from the opposition party, the Republican Party. All of the votes to pass the most important legislation since the uh, most important democratic legislation since the 1960s passed without a single vote from the Republican Party. Just this last year, the Republicans in the House threatened to uh, bring the United States to default on its debt if major changes were not made in U.S. fiscal policy, if major cuts were not made in the U.S. budget. And after much negotiation, finally, very deep cuts were enacted in the uh, federal budget. Um, but the whole uh, episode, the whole conflict between Republicans and Democrats in the House and in the Senate and with the President reached such a point that when a polling organization asked American the American people, do you think that elected officials in Washington who have dealt with the debt ceiling in the past few months have be behaved like responsible adults or mostly like spoiled children? And 77% of the American public said they had behaved like spoiled children. Finally, things have reached such a pass in Washington that the members of Congress who are in the middle of the political spectrum, who are moderates, who are neither very liberal nor very conservative, have decided to leave the United States Congress. And so in 2010, a moderate Democratic senator from Indiana, Evan Bayh, left the United States Senate decided not to run for re-election, citing a poisonous partisan atmosphere. Even at a time of enormous challenge, he said, the people's business is not being done. And only a few weeks ago, a moderate Republican senator, Senator Olympia Snow from Maine, announced that she would not run for re-election, echoing the comments, echoing the reasons that Senator Bayh had given for deciding not to run for re-election himself. And so there are a number of moderates in this election cycle, a number of moderate Republicans, a number of moderate Democrats, who have decided that they can't take it anymore, that the polarization of American politics is just too great, that it's too difficult to get anything done in Washington. What I want to talk about then in the next half hour is I want to talk a little bit about what the polarization in American politics looks like in government but also how that polarization is reflected and reinforced by the polarization among the American electorate, among the voters of the United States. And then I want to turn my attention to the 2012 election and think about the ways in which the polarized political atmosphere in the United States might affect the 2012 election and beyond. So let me begin by talking a little bit about the polarization of American national government. The episodes that we've seen in the last couple of Congresses during the Obama administration is actually just a continuation of a long time trend in American politics toward greater conflict between Republicans and Democrats in American national elections. Just to review, for those of you who may be less familiar with the American political system, let me just review very quickly what's required in order to pass legislation in the United States. The United States has a system of divided government, as many of you will know. There is a legislative branch made up of two chambers, the American House of Representatives and the United States Senate, both of which must pass legislation before it can become law. The United States House of Representatives comprises 435 members, there are seven states that have just one representative, and the representatives are apportioned according to population. The largest state, California, 
has 55 representatives in the United States House of Representatives. The United States Senate, which meets on the north wing of the Capitol, the United States Senate comprises two senators for each of the 50 states, and so there are 100 members of the United States Senate. Once Congress passes a law, once both houses of Congress have passed a piece of legislation, it then goes on to the President of the United States, currently Barack Obama, who decides whether to sign that legislation into law or to exercise what's called a veto, rejecting that legislation. Okay. And so the polarization that I'm talking about, that I'm discussing right now, is polarization that, first of all, makes it difficult for Congress to pass legislation and difficult for Congress and the President to come to agreement on legislation. Okay? So that's really what's at stake in the polarization of the American public and the polarization of American government. As I've already claimed, American government has become more polarized over a long period of time. It did not begin in the last several years. Let me show you, for instance, the support for the policies advocated by the President according to party in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. There are two parties in the United States, of course, the Democratic Party, the more liberal party, the party of President Barack Obama, and the Republican Party, the more conservative party. What this graph shows is the support for the President's policies among members of his own party and among members of the opposition party. Okay? And so, for instance, here is the Eisenhower administration. This is the support for President Eisenhower's policies by his fellow Republicans in Congress, in the House of Representatives. And this is the support for his policies among the opposition party, the Democrats, in Congress. Okay? So I want you to notice a couple of things about this graph. The first is that the President's own party, unsurprisingly, always supports the president's policies more than the opposition party. Okay? So in this case, we have Eisenhower's Republicans supporting Eisenhower more than the opposition Democrats. At the very end, we have uh, President Obama's Democratic colleagues in Congress supporting his policies much more than the Republicans in the United States House of Representatives. So that's the first thing to notice. There's always been a split between Republicans and Democrats in the extent to which they support the policies of the president. The important thing to notice in this graph, however, is that that split has gotten larger over time, quite a lot larger over time. That is, back here in the Eisenhower administration, there was about a 15 or 20 percent point difference in the likelihood that Democrats and Republicans would support the policies of the Eisenhower administration. By the time we reached the George W. Bush administration, right here, or the Obama administration, right here, the gap in support is more along the lines of about 60 percent, 50 or 60 percent difference in support between the president's own party and the opposition party. That's what we mean by partisan polarization. The two parties are further apart on these matters than they were before, and the president's program is that much harder to enact. There's a reason for the increasing polarization in Congress, and that's because the correspondence between the party identifications, the party affiliations that members of Congress have, and their policy views <coughs> is in much closer correspondence than it used to be. Okay? One of the things to know about the American system is that anybody can announce that he or she is a Republican or a Democrat. Okay? That is, there is no test, there is no membership application. It's entirely voluntary to say that you're a Republican or a Democrat. And in years past, what that meant was that there were conservatives who would say, well, I'm a Democrat, and there were liberals or moderates who would say that I'm a Republican. And in fact, if we look at the distribution of policy preferences among Republicans and Democrats in 1967, this was during the last Congress of the Lyndon B. Johnson administration, a Democrat, a Congress that was controlled by the Democrats, what we'll see is that in fact there was a fair bit of overlap between the policy preferences of Democrats in the House 
and the policy preferences of Republicans in the House. What's on this axis right here is a statistical measure of policy preferences that is based on voting <coughs> in the United States House. What each of these bars shows is the number of House members who have preferences within that particular range. Throughout, I've indicated Democrats by blue and Republicans by red. And so here again, notice a couple of things about this distribution. The first is that the average Democrat is to the left of the average Republican. Okay, So on average, the Democrats in the House of Representatives were more liberal than the members of the House from the Republican Party. The other thing to notice, however, is that there are a fair number of representatives who are in the middle of the distribution. That is, there are actually a fairly large number of conservative Democrats. Okay, These are Democrats. These blue bars here are Democrats who are fairly conservative. And likewise, there are even a few Republican moderates and even liberals. Well, let's fast forward 40 years to the last Congress of the George W. Bush administration. Okay. Now what you'll notice is that Democrats are still a liberal party, and Republicans are still a conservative party, but both parties are more uniformly of a particular policy persuasion than they were before. In fact, there is no middle in this distribution. The most conservative Democrat in the House of Representatives is more liberal than the most liberal Republican in the House of Representatives and this is also true of the United States Senate. Okay. So two things have happened. One is that the parties have moved apart. Okay. You can see that the average Republican in particular is to the right of the average Republican 40 years ago. The Democrats have moved a little bit further to the left, but not a whole lot further to the left. But the most important thing is that the middle has completely disappeared. There are no conservative Democrats, really, in the House. There are no liberal or moderate Republicans in the House of Representatives. So the parties have moved apart, and the middle has collapsed. It turns out, however, that partisan polarization is not simply a matter of the elite level. It's not just a matter of the way that our elected officials in the United States behave. It's also infected the American population. And there's been a polarization as well of the U.S. electorate. This graph is based on survey data, survey data from the 1970s. This is averaging 1972 and 1976, and from 2004 and 2008. These survey data asked respondents to place themselves on a liberal to conservative scale where the left end of the scale was liberal, the right end of the scale was conservative, and the middle category was marked moderate or middle of the road. Okay. A couple things to notice about this graph. The first is that there has been a bit of a polarization, a move apart in the distribution of ideology, the distribution of policy preferences among the American public. That is, there are a few fewer moderates and a few more liberals and conservatives <coughs> particularly conservatives. Okay, so there has been a flattening of the distribution. The important thing to notice about this graph, however, is that the American public was in the 1970s and remains in the 2000s a moderate electorate. Okay, the balance of the American public sees itself as being in the middle of the road, as being neither liberal nor conservative, but moderate in its political leanings. What has changed has been the relationship between policy preferences and the electorate and the partisan identification of members of the electorate. That is, Americans too think of themselves, ordinary voters think of themselves, as being Republicans or Democrats. And we have quite a lot of evidence to indicate that people form these identifications as Republicans and Democrats fairly early in their lives, during their 20s, and pretty much stay Republicans or Democrats for the rest of their lives. 
And the way that they identify themselves as Republicans and Democrats has an enormous influence, not just on the way they vote, but it has an enormous influence as well on the way that they see the world. What's happened over time is that Republicans and Democrats have also split apart in the American electorate in their policy preferences. So here's the same graph, this time broken down by Democrats and Republicans. The Democrats are getting blue, the Republicans in red. In the 1970s, the bulk of most of both parties, the average Democrat and the average Republican in the 1970s, considered him or herself to be a moderate, to be middle of the road. Okay. Yes, it's the case <coughs> that Republicans were more conservative on average. That distribution leans to the right. And yes, it's the case that the Democrats were more liberal on average. But there were still plenty of conservative Democrats and plenty of liberal to moderate Republicans. Now fast forward 30 years, and the distribution looks like this. Okay. That is, the Democrat have moved a bit to the left. Okay. That is, people who call themselves Democrats also call themselves liberals to a much greater extent than in the 1970s. And especially among Republicans, the heart of the Republican <coughs> At, um, of the Republican electorate is a conservative electorate. That is, Republican voters are more uniformly conservative than they were in the 1970s. And so just as we saw a splitting apart of Democrats and Republicans in the United States House and the United States Senate, we've seen a splitting apart of Democrats and Republicans among the American voters as well. And this has a considerable influence on our politics as well. <coughs> This is a graph that shows the public approval of the president's job performance by party. Since the 1930s or the 1940s, the Gallup organization, the famous public opinion organization, has asked the American public, do you approve or disapprove of the job that President, say, Obama has done as president of the United States? And so what this shows is the percentage of each party's partisans, okay, the percentage of people who call themselves Democrats, and the percentage of people who call themselves Republican who say that they support or that they approve of the president's job performance. So right over here, here is the support of the Democrats, people who call themselves Democrats for the policies of the Truman administration, and here is the support of Republicans. Way down on the other end, that's the support of Democrats, and that's the support of Republicans for President Barack Obama. Okay. Once again, we see the same kind of thing, that members of the president's own party are more likely to support the president's job performance than, than members of the opposition party. The second thing, however, is that the gap in approval has once again gotten much larger. Okay? That is, um, the, uh, the, the distance between members of the president's party and members of the opposition party in the approval of the president has gone from something on the order of 30 or 40 percentage points to 65 or 70 percentage points. Incidentally, um, there's been some uh, talk made about how Barack Obama is the most polarizing president in American history. That's true only if you look at his first year. And it's true if you look at his first year because that spike in approval for President George W. Bush among Democrats was because of September 11th, okay? And so George W. Bush got a huge approval boost among members of both parties uh, from the attacks uh, on the United States in at September 11th. Otherwise, you can see, uh, by the time George W. Bush left office uh, in uh, 2008, his approval among Democrats was less than 10%, okay? That's close enough. That's getting into sampling error territory. Okay? <laughs> So um, there's been increasing polarization of the electorate. Now, I can get into it later. There seems to be evidence that the polarization of American elected officials happened before the polarization of the American public. So it seems like it was the elite polarization that caused the voter polarization. Um, but it's now to the point where that um, polarization is mutually reinforcing. Okay, the Congress is, is polarized 
means that the electorate is polarized, if the electorate is polarized, means the Congress is polarized. The question, though, for us right now is what effect partisan polarization is likely to have on the 2012 election. The argument that I'm going to make is that except rhetorically, partisan polarization will have hardly any effect on the 2012 election. It's a paradox that I want to explain. It turns out that in elections, elections themselves are very polarizing. They're polarizing in the sense that people are running for office, they're competing, and they have a strong incentive to point out the differences between themselves and the opposition candidate. And so that's the way that people run election campaigns. They say, I'm all virtue and my opponent is all vice. Okay? And it turns out that partisans like that kind of thing. People who consider themselves to be Republicans and Democrats say, yes, the Democrats are all virtue and the Republicans are all a bunch of scoundrels. And so over the course of the election campaign, in fact, people's emotions get whipped up by the candidates. However, the main influence on the election outcomes, on who actually wins and who actually loses, turn out to have very, very little to do with the extent to which candidates whip up the enthusiasm of their supporters and try to dampen the enthusiasm of their opponents. And so the paradox here is that elections, even though they sharpen partisan differences, in fact tend to bring the two parties together. And so let me explain why that's the case. Political scientists have spent a good number of years trying to understand what the main influences on U.S. national elections are. And those influences have come to be called, at least in the circle I keep, the election fundamentals. The primary influences that year in and year out affect the outcomes of presidential elections. And I have a list of them here. And what's going to be remarkable about this list is how little they relate to partisan polarization. First off, Two of the important influences on elections year in and year out have to do with the conditions that prevail at the time of the American election. Have to do with presidential performance. Whether the president is responsible for them or not doesn't matter. The question is, what have things been like during the president's term? One such is the condition of the economy. Is the economy good or bad? Is the economy getting better? Or is the economy getting worse? Incumbent parties do much better when the economy is improving, and they do much worse in presidential elections when the economy is getting worse. A second performance influence is the condition of public affair, or foreign affairs. American presidents are punished by the electorate for involvement in wars. The American public here in Iraq has uh, taken, um, uh, extracted a bit of punishment uh, from American presidents who've been involved in uh, costly uh, foreign ventures. The thing to notice about these two performance issues, however, is that they have nothing to do with partisanship. That is, the voters hold Republican candidates, Republican incumbents uh, accountable for the conditions uh, during their terms in office, and likewise, they hold Democratic incumbents accountable for the conditions during their terms in office. A second substantial fundamental interest or influence on elections is incumbency. In the American political system, it turns out that people who already hold office have an enormous advantage in elections over people who do not currently hold office. That is, incumbents are much, much advantaged relative to challengers. That is true whether the office is dog catcher whether the, whether the office is mayor, governor, U.S. senator, U.S. representative, or president of the United States. And so incumbent presidents who run for re-election do better on average than challengers who are running for re-election, or, or, um, uh, or, or two candidates, neither of whom is an incumbent uh, running in the election. So incumbency has a substantial effect <coughs> on the election outcomes as well. This is likewise a factor that has very little to do with partisanship. That is, incumbency is something that can be enjoyed by Republican candidates or by Democratic candidates. Incumbency is neutral in terms of the partisan implications. A fifth 
or excuse me, a fourth substantial factor uh, in the election fundamentals is the baseline partisanship of the electorate. I've already indicated that whether one thinks of oneself as a Republican or as a Democrat has a very large influence on the way that people actually vote in the election. One analyst refers to partisan identification as a standing decision to support one party or another party <coughs> unless something goes wrong. Okay? And so the standing decision is going to affect the competitive balance between the two parties. And as we'll see, the baseline partisanship of the electorate has changed over time. Finally, there's the matter of the positioning of the candidates on the issues. Okay. As we've already seen, the American public considers itself to be fairly moderate on the issues. Okay. If you ask them to place themselves, they say, I am middle of the road. Over time, the candidates who have been seen to be closer to the policy positions of the American electorate have done better than those who have been seen to be further away. That is, the two-party competitive system in the United States favors moderate parties and forces both parties, both the Republicans and the Democrats, to run to the middle in the fall campaign. So there's an enormous incentive in a two-party system to be very close on the issues to where the voters are, which means being very close on the issues to where the other party is. And so it's in this way that elections even though they excite the passions of the voters, help to bring the two parties together. The bottom line then is that American governor, Americans may govern from the extreme, but they win elections in the middle. There's a populist Democratic candidate from the state of Texas, Jim Hightower, who always likes to say that the only thing you'll find in the middle of the road is yellow lines and dead armadillos. Armadillos are little animals that aren't very fleet and get run over in the middle of the road. There, in fact, are three things in the middle of the road, yellow lines, dead armadillos, and winning political candidates in the two-party <laughs> system. So let me review, then, the way the election fundamentals look in the 2012 election. And so what I want to suggest is that some of the fundamentals are challenges for President Obama in his re-election campaign. Some of them are advantages for President Obama. And then I'll give you something of a summary judgment about where things stand six or seven or eight months in advance of the coming election. The first of President Obama's re-election challenges is the baseline partisanship of the electorate. What this graph shows is the percentage of the US voters who consider themselves to be Democrats, shown in blue, who consider themselves to be Republicans, shown in red, or consider themselves to be independents, neither Republicans nor Democrats, nor leaning toward the Republicans nor the Democrats. Okay. As you can see, this particular source shows that there have consistently been more Democratic identifying voters in the American electorate than there have been Republican identifying voters in the American electorate. This particular source is the American National Election Studies, it tends to have a slight Democratic bias. And if you look at other sources, what you'll find is that, in fact, the current balance between Republicans and Democrats in the American electorate is fairly close. Okay? That there are roughly equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans out there in the electorate. Why is this a challenge for President Barack Obama? Well, it's a challenge compared to history. Because back in the 1950s through the late 1970s, the Democrats routinely had an advantage in every election because more voters considered themselves to be Democrats than considered themselves to be Republicans. And the sea change came in the 1980s during the Ronald Reagan administration when there was a sudden break in partisan identification away from Democrats and toward Republicans, and that gap got closed to either very small in favor of the Democrats or not in favor of the Democrats at all. So Barack Obama has the task of running for re-election in an environment where he has less of a head start than his fellow Democrats had in running for re-election in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. And so one of Obama's challenges is that he's running in a country that is fairly closely divided between Republicans and Democrats. 
A second of Obama's challenges has to do with the positioning of the candidates on the issues. As I indicated before, candidates who are closer to the position of the electorate are more likely to have more success than candidates who are further away. These data, again, come from the American National Election Studies, and they show the number of members of the American electorate who view themselves as being closer to the Republican candidate in red or being closer to the Democratic candidate in blue. And it's not a perfect relationship, but there is a relationship that shows that on average, the candidates who win, here shown by the black dots, are the candidates who are closer to the electorate. So for instance, in the 2008 election, a larger percentage of the United States electorate saw Barack Obama as closer to them on the issues than uh, the electorate saw John McCain as closer <coughs> to them on the issues. So why is this a challenge for Barack Obama? Again, in historical terms, Barack Obama is the first liberal democratic northern president since John Kennedy, who was elected in 1960. Every Democratic president who has served since John Kennedy, who served from 1960 until his assassination in 1963, every Democratic president until that time was a Southerner, and two out of the three were quite conservative, among the most conservative Democratic presidents of the 20th century. Lyndon Johnson from Texas, Jimmy Carter from Georgia, and Bill Clinton from Arkansas. Okay. So the circumstances of the 2008 election meant that for the first time in 50 years, a liberal northerner was able to get elected as a Democrat to the presidency of the United States. And so going into the fall election, Barack Obama is seen correctly by the American public as being a fairly liberal candidate. And depending upon who the Republicans nominate, okay, it could turn out that Barack Obama is either closer or further away from the electorate than the opposing Republican candidate. The most troublesome, of course, would be Mitt Romney, who is seen as being a fairly moderate uh, Republican candidate. The big problem that Barack Obama has is that he's been very controversial in terms of his job performance among the American public. What this scatter plot shows is election <coughs> years. And on each of these election years, I've indicated the approval of the incumbent president's job performance in the nearest Gallup poll to the election. Okay. And the percentage of the two-party vote, the vote between Republicans and Democrats, that the incumbent party received in that election. And so, just to take an example, this data point right here is the 2004 election when George W. Bush ran for re-election. George W. Bush's approval rating at the time was a little over 50%, and George W. Bush received about 51.5% uh, of the two-party vote in the 2004 election. Right now, President Obama's job approval rating is between 45 and 50 percent. Okay. And if you take 45 to 50 percent and you project it up to this regression line and you bring it across, you see that things look better than worse for Barack Obama, but they do not look great for Barack Obama. Okay? That is, Barack Obama's job performance rating is very marginal for an incumbent president running for re-election. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is that presidential approval is very, very closely tied to the opinion that the public has of what the economic conditions are at the time. And so this is a different scatter plot. The vertical axis is the same. It's the percentage of the two-party vote that is won by the incumbent party, the party that currently controls the White House. Here, however, the independent variable is the change in real in disposable income per capita. That is, how much the amount of money that people have in their pockets to spend has gone up or gone down. Right? And as you can see, the larger the change, the larger the increase in real disposable income per capita, the better the incumbent party does in the election. 
once again. Uh, here is uh, President George W. Bush. Uh, economic growth around uh, 3% and got about 51.5% uh, of the vote. Right now, the best projection for economic growth in the United States for this year is about 2.6%. If we take 2.6%, project it up to this progression line and across, once again, we have President Obama uh, getting uh, perhaps a squeak through victory uh, in November. Now, the advantage for Barack Obama, however, is that after four years, the economy in the United States is finally showing signs of life. It seems to be improving. And the most important thing in the economic conditions and their effect on elections is not whether unemployment is high or low. It's not where gro whether growth is high or low. It is what the change has been. It's the delta. Okay? It's whether things have been getting better or whether things have been getting worse. And so as Barack Obama enters into the 2012 election season, the White House has to be praying that the economy continues to improve and that Barack Obama perhaps uh, is able to move up to 3% uh, growth, in which case his re-election would be much more secure. Okay? So those are the important challenges and at least initially one of the advantages for Barack Obama um, he's presiding over a very difficult economy. Uh, he is seen as a more liberal Democrat, um, and the balance of party forces in the American electorate is not entirely to his advantage. But Barack Obama also has some distinct advantages among the fundamentals. One is the condition of foreign affairs. Barack Obama is, has effectively withdrawn U.S. forces from Iraq, is winding down the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan. And so unlike the situation in 2004, when George W. Bush was running for re-election in the midst of an unpopular war, Barack Obama is actually winding down the U.S. commitments abroad. Moreover, this administration, whether it's because it's lucky or because it's good, has enjoyed considerable success operationally in U.S. foreign policy. As all of you know, Barack Obama gave the order that led to the military operation that killed Osama bin Laden, something that was enormously popular among the U.S. Uh, population and something that the previous president had been unable to achieve despite eight years or seven and a half years of trying. Uh, likewise, the foreign policy, uh, uh, the foreign policies uh, toward uh, the uh, change in regime in Libya and the change in regime in Egypt uh, have turned out quite successful, have turned out quite well for the U.S. administration. In fact, there's an argument to be made that Hillary Clinton has turned out to be the most successful U.S. Secretary of State since James Baker in the first uh, George Bush administration. So one of Obama's advantages is a fairly good record in foreign policy of winding down the kind of damaging conflicts that weight down presidents when they run for re-election. Obama's other big advantage is that he's running in 2012 as the incumbent. As I indicated before, incumbency is a significant advantage in presidential elections. Some of the best estimates indicate that incumbency by itself, that running as an incumbent is worth about four percentage points of the popular vote. Four percentage points of the popular vote is an enormous number if you're talking about winning and losing elections by a point or two. Okay? So a 4% point advantage is a considerable advantage. Some sense of how substantial that advantage is, is given by this listing. Since 1936, there have been 13 incumbent presidents who have run for re-election. Of those 13 incumbent presidents who have run for re-election, 10 of them have succeeded in their bids for re-election, only three of them have failed in their bids for re-election. That is, going into the fall election, an incumbent president has about a three in four chance of winning uh, the uh, re-election campaign. And so it's overall quite likely that, uh, that uh, uh, Barack Obama will be able to join the winners among incumbents than the losers among incumbents. So the bottom line, my bottom line is that uh, the election fundamentals right now probably favor Barack Obama to win re-election. 
but it's going to be very, very close. There is no way that Barack Obama will win the election in 2012 by the kind of margin that he enjoyed in 2008. The conditions in 2008 were much, much more favorable to the Obama candidacy than the conditions in 2012. However, the conditions, it looks like, are about good enough. In fact, they look an awful lot like the conditions that George W. Bush ran for re-election under in 2004, and that turned out pretty well for George W. Bush. A couple of other comments about the fall election. Uh, the first is about what's likely to happen in the United States Senate. Okay. A couple of comments just at the beginning about congressional election. The first is that everything in the fall campaign season that works to the advantage of Barack Obama will also work to the advantage of Democratic candidates for the House and the Senate. So anything that is good for Obama is good for the Democrats. <coughs> Secondly, there is also an enormous incumbency advantage in House and Senate elections. And because the Republicans currently control the House, they enjoy the advantages of incumbency in more races than their opponents, and the, and the Democrats in the Senate enjoy the effects of incumbency in more races than their opponents. However, in the current election cycle, one-third of the membership of the United States Senate is elected in each two-year election cycle. This year is a class one year, as it's called, which means that 33 members of the United States Senate are up for election. Of those 33, however, 21 are Democrats, and two more are independents who vote with the Democrats. So effectively, the Democrats have 23 seats up for re-election in the 2012 election season. The Republicans only have 10. That is, the Democrats are defending twice as many seats from the Republicans as the Republicans are defending from the Democrats. My expectation is that the Republicans will pick up seats in the United States Senate, probably sufficient to make the United States Senate a Republican-controlled Senate. Okay? Probably not a huge number, but enough to take control. In the House, on the other hand, the situation is almost exactly reversed. The Republicans picked up a lot of seats, 63 seats, in fact, in the 2010 midterm election. That's the third largest seat pickup since 1900. It was a rout. Okay. What that means is that there are a lot of Republicans in the House who represent districts that are very Democratic in their voting orientations. So for instance, here's the right uh, road to take a look at. What this shows is the number of Republicans who hold congressional districts that had voted for Barack Obama in the 2008 election. Okay. So what this shows is that there is one Republican who turns out to be the representative of the 10th Congressional District in the northern suburbs of Chicago. Okay. There is one Republican who represents a district that Barack Obama won by more than 20 percentage points. That is, by a margin of greater than 60% to 40%. Okay. There are another 15 Republicans who represent districts that Barack Obama won in 2008 by between 15 and 20 percentage points and 21 who represent districts that Obama had won in 2008 by five to 10 percentage points. Add those together and you come up with 36 districts, 36 seats that the Republicans are defending in Democratic territory. Okay. And so chances are that the Republicans will actually lose seats in the House of Representatives in 2012 because they're trying to hold on to more hostile territory than the Republican or than the Democrats are trying to hold on to right now. As you can see, uh, there are only 12 seats total that are currently held by Democrats that have been won by John McCain in the 2008 election. So most likely then, the most likely outcome, I think, for the fall campaign is Barack Obama is reelected as president, the Republicans come to control the United States Senate, and the Republicans continue to control the United States House, but by a much closer margin than they had in the current Congress. But then what? What happens then? The 2012 election is not going to make partisan polarization go away. 
Okay? Republicans and Democrats in the House of Representatives and in the Senate are going to be just as divided between in their policy views as they were before the 2012 election. And as we've seen, that's considerably had, uh, that's considerably divided. However, I think that the likely outcomes depend a lot on whether the incumbent president, whether the next president is a Republican, <coughs> in which case we have unified government, okay, where all of the policy making votes in the US system are controlled by one party, or whether we have divided government with a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. And here I'm going to suggest the second paradox. The second paradox is that divided government is more likely to bring us together than unified control of the presidency, the House, and the Senate. So let me take those possibilities in turn. Suppose that a Republican wins the fall campaign in 2012. What does our politics look like? Well, as I've already indicated, there will be continued polarization between Republicans and Democrats in the House and in the Senate. However, I would expect that the Republicans in the House and the Senate will see much less urgency in reducing the debt and cutting spending than they do in the current administration. And the reason for this is simple, that once the Republicans control the White House, they are responsible for what happens in US national government. People don't like to have spending cut. People are not really all that interested in debt reduction. They want low taxes, they want high spending, and they don't like people who either cut their spending or increase their taxes. And so under unified control, if taxes are going to be raised to reduce the debt, or if spending is going to be cut to reduce the debt, the Republicans are going to have to do it all by themselves. Okay, that is, they're going to have to take responsibility for it. Right now, the Republicans in Congress can <coughs> say, the Democrats should really cut that spending. Okay, the Democrats are the ones in charge now. It's really easy when you're in the opposition to say that somebody else should do something hard. When you're responsible, it's very difficult to do something hard. So I think that we'll see uh, a, a much less, uh, uh, a sort of much less uh, push among the Republicans even to cut spending, to reduce the debt, and so forth, if a Republican wins the White House. Second is that if Republicans are going to make changes under unified government, they're going to have to make changes without any cooperation at all from the Democrats in the House or the Democrats in the Senate. From the Democrats' standpoint, the Republicans have spent the last four years opposing everything that Barack Obama wants to do. Okay. Under those circumstances, the Democrats in the House and the Democrats in the Senate are going to be in no mood to help Mitt Romney or any other Republican to do anything. They're going to have to do it all on their own and to take responsibility. Moreover, as I've already indicated, I think that the Republicans will control the Senate by a small margin and that they will control the House by a smaller margin, which means that the, Democrat or the Republicans will be unable to do anything without some cooperation from the Democrats. Okay, so it's not only going to be difficult for the Republicans to take responsibility, it's that they won't be able to get anything done, even if they decide to try. Finally, doing something significant in policy after the 2012 election has the potential to put some significant strains on the coalition that the Republicans put together in elections. That is, among the supporters of the Republicans themselves. This is my final graph on partisanship. Okay. Once again, the blue line is Democrats, the red line is Republicans, and the green line is independents. What this graph shows, however, is the distribution of party identification in the electorate. The number of people who consider themselves Democrats, the number who consider themselves Republicans, according to the year in which they were born. And so, for instance, right over here, we have the percentage of the American public uh, that considers itself to be Republicans who were born in the 1890s. Okay. And right here, the percentage of the population born in the 1890s who consider themselves to be Democrats. So these are 10-year birth cohorts. Okay. These are basically people of the same age going through the electorate, voting in a number of elections. Okay. Once again, there are two things, maybe three things that I want you to notice. The first thing I want you to notice 
is that the peak democratic cohort, okay, that is the most democratic cohort, the largest number of voters who identify as Democrat, was the cohort that was born in the 19 teens. Okay, they were born between 1911 and 1920. What that means is they came of age in politics. They began to participate in politics in the 1930s during Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Very successful Democratic president, very successful Democratic policy program, which meant that lots and lots and lots of people in that age cohort became Democrats. In the 1980s, when Ronald Reagan was proposing to cut Social Security, they were the ones who were entering retirement age. Okay, And so in the 1980s, cutting Social Security was really, really great for the Republicans and really, really terrible for the Democrats. It was a great issue for the Democrats to mobilize with. However, take a look at this cohort. This cohort is the peak Republican cohort. It's the voter cohort, the age cohort in the American electorate with the largest number of Republicans and the fewest number of Democrats. If you follow that down, you'll see that this is the age cohort that was born in the 1960s, between 1961 and 1970. Incidentally, this is the age cohort that includes Barack Obama, who was born in 1961. Okay. What has happened in the American electorate over the last 50 years is that every succeeding cohort has become less and less democratic and more and more republican than the cohort that preceded it. That is, the baby boom generation that is about to retire is the most Republican cohort in the American electorate, which will make it very difficult for the Republicans to decide to cut things like Social Security and Medicare, the kinds of things that benefit the elderly and therefore their core voters um, in the electorate. Now, what is special about these people who were born in the 1960s? They came of age in the 1980s during the Ronald Reagan administration, a very successful Republican administration, very successful Republican program that led this cohort to be overwhelmingly or, or more significantly Republican than preceding cohorts. The last thing to notice, of course, is that if these numbers hold up, the new generations in American politics have broken quite sharply toward the Democrats. Okay. So there's long-term benefit, perhaps, for the Democrats in this story. Okay. So, if we have unified government, if we have a Republican president, a Republican House, and a Republican Senate, the likelihood is that we will muddle along a little bit further through a period of intense partisan polarization. Suppose, on the other hand, that Barack Obama wins re-election and we have divided government. We have a Democrat in the White House, we have Republicans in control of the House, and in control of the Senate. Once again, there will be continued polarization the gulf between Republicans and Democrats will not get any closer as a result of the 2012 election. However, I've already indicated that if this is what happens, we'll essentially have a split verdict from the American public. The American public will have re-elected a Democrat Barack Obama as president. The, Repu the electorate will have given more seats in the House of Representatives to the Democratic Party. And the electorate will have given more seats in the United States Senate to the Republican Party. There is no story that anybody can tell from that election that says that the voters gave us, my party, a mandate to do something big. Okay? So there's no mandate. There's no party that can basically say, we're the ones the voters told to do this. Okay? Secondly, I think that there will be fewer incentives for the Republicans in the Congress to sabotage a second Obama term than a first Obama term for the simple fact that Barack Obama is prohibited by the United States Constitution from running for re-election in 2016. Okay. And so no matter what the Republicans do over the course of the next two Congresses, there will be a new president, perhaps a Republican president, who is elected in 2016. So there is nothing that they can do to change what's going to happen in 2016 in terms of opposing or supporting the program of Barack Obama. Finally, and most importantly, the divided government sets up the possibility of shared responsibility. Okay. Sets up the possibility that the parties will be able to agree to do something difficult by each of them doing something difficult and each of them taking responsibility for it equally. 
The Republicans do not want to raise taxes. Their constituents do not want to, them to raise taxes. But if they cooperate with the Democrats, they can manage to cut spending if they will raise taxes. They can take credit for cutting spending even though they will be blamed for participating in raising taxes. On the other side, the Democrats, their constituents don't want them to cut spending. But the Democrats can argue to their constituents that, yes, we agreed to cut spending, but we also increased taxes. Okay? That is, a grand bargain is made possible by the prospect that Republicans and Democrats can share responsibility for a decision and therefore take it off of the table in terms of the electoral politics. Finally, the likelihood of taking shared responsibility, I think, is increased by something that I call the double witching hour. Okay. The witching hour is an expression that indicates the time right around midnight where spirits are out and anything can happen. Okay. And the witching hour in American politics has to do with concrete deadlines written into US law okay, that mean that significant change will have to occur before the 1st of January or both parties are going to be very, very unhappy. So what does that look like? Here is the federal budget timeline. As a result of the deal between President Obama and the Republicans that raised the debt ceiling in July and August, okay, President Obama signed a Budget Control Act into law that has a poison pill in it. And that poison pill begins, or that poison pill takes effect on the 2nd of January. On the 1st of January, as a result of an earlier budget agreement, the tax cuts that were engineered by President Bush in his first term, and which significantly reduced taxes for most Americans, and significantly especially reduced taxes for wealthy Americans, those tax cuts will simply expire. Which means that unless Congress and the President take action before January 1st, 2013, before the new Congress is inaugurated, Okay, before the new president is inaugurated, unless Congress takes action in January 1st, before January 1st, 2013, taxes will go up. Taxes will go up for most Americans. Taxes will go up significantly for wealthy Americans. The day after the taxes go up, unless Congress and the president act, automatic spending cuts that were agreed to in August will go into effect. And what do those automatic spending cuts look like? What do they affect? The largest effect that they have, boy, that didn't turn out very well, did it? The largest effect that they have is on national defense spending. Okay. The biggest cuts will come in the US defense budget. There will also be uh, significant cuts uh, in Medicare and in what's called non-defense discretionary cuts. Okay. What's not affected is a bunch of spending that Americans call entitlement spending, which includes things like Social Security, okay, the other things that need a lot of, of mending. Okay. So unless Congress and the President act, and act together in December of 2012, after the election, taxes are going to go up significantly, and spending cuts are going to be made that will significantly affect the defense budget, Medicare, and other programs in the United States. And so it's that double witching hour, the expiration of the Bush tax cuts, the implementation of the automatic budget cuts, that gives both parties the incentive to try to cut a deal that at least looks better than what will be the case if they fail to act. And so it is quite possible in 2013, I think, that despite ourselves, despite <coughs> the polarization in the American electorate, and despite the polarization in the American Congress and the American government, that we might in fact be able to come together and in that way live up to the motto of the United States, a pluribus unum, out of many, one. Thank you. <laughs>